när jag stannar, när jag stannar så är trycker jag på röd. Röd och, och när, jag, när jag pausar någon av dem. Någon av dem. Okej. Okay. Då kan man titta lite. All right, so, so we're live now? We're live now, okay. So let's uh, let's start this. <laughs> um, yeah, so welcome. Uh, so this is uh, what, five, eight of you. That's that's good. That's more than usual. Uh, and uh, we will never see a pattern because uh, there's only lectures today. So, but thank you for being here today. It's actually way uh, more motivating to to have somebody in front of you when you talk, as, as you probably know yourself. Uh, so, so my name is Ola Peterson, and this is Lasse Lars Karlsson, and uh, so can we were responsible for this course. I'm a uh, I'm not based here. I'm based in uh, in uh, in California, so I'm only here today for this course. And then uh, Lasse will he's your main guy on this course, so he will take take care of the weekly, the daily stuff, any 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 stuff. And then I'm going to be over there and uh, and uh, assist him if he needs any help, or uh, be on his case if he <laughs> if he if he does if he doesn't uh, uh, kick your butts. Uh, so, so the course is this still the name of the course, Agile Development Engineer Practices. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, so the structure of the course, all lectures are today, uh, and it's really this is really a course in in agile software development, uh, agile product development, I would say. So it's a way to learn a way of working. Some of you might have some experiences with this before, either in the in the workplace or, or, uh, or as, as, as students, but it doesn't hurt to do it and do it right once. Right? There's a lot of attempts to in, in kind of take some little pieces from this agile space and I integrate it into how you do things. But to do, you, you learn how to do it right once, and, and you might not like it or you might like it, but at least you know it. It's like I tell people, like, you know, if you're going to make a lasagna, right? if you look, look at the recipe for lasagna and says, follow this recipe, you get a good lasagna. Well, the first thing you do is not to modify, modify the recipe, right? You, you try to make the lasagna once, and then maybe, based on the out outcome of that, you, you might modify the recipe next time around, right? So it's just good to do it, to do it by the book once. Um, yeah, so it's a software project. Lectures today, the project starts hopefully on, as Lasse's plan at least, on, on, on Friday, and then you're going to have weekly iterations with meetings with him and, and weekly uh, kind of goals. So we're going to go through all of that stuff. Uh, so each student is assigned to a cross-functional team. So we're going to use Scrum as the methodology, as the Azure methodology. Each team has six to eight, I don't know if it's going to be six to eight, seven to nine students or something like that on that. Uh, so each team works on one project. You're all going to work on the same project, I think, right? But in parallel. Uh, you might get different directives from Lasse, who's going to be the one responsible for driving what you're building. You're the ones responsible for building it. Uh, as I said, weekly sprints, as the iterations are called in, in, a, in a Scrum lingo. Uh, and then we mandatory weekly presentations or progress. There's just no way around this, and you will <laughs> you'll see this once it starts, right? That it's how it works. Uh, mandatory daily meetings. Uh, I said, yeah, how's that going to work, right? With people working all over the place. But yeah, yeah, you need to figure that out. And, and obviously, it will probably happen by using some electronic communication tool, right? But you just have to figure it out. Sometimes you might have to have that meeting at 8 p.m. because of how people are working or they're scheduled with uh, solving the life puzzle, the kids, and all that stuff, you know? Uh, and then finally, it's going to be a final presentation on January 15. Uh, everything is published in my Moodle uh, communication tool. I mean, you can do something else, but we kind of recommend Slack. It's been working well for, for teams in the past, and, and it seems like most uh, students are pretty familiar with it by now. Uh, project management tool, we're going to use something called Redmine, an old-ass tool. But you know, it does the job. It 
does the job for what we need here. It has nothing extra. It has exactly what we need for this. Right? It's sluggish and old, uh, but it works. And you're going to get you to get GitHub as, as a repository. Uh, after each week, right? So this is weekly iterations, right? You're going to do something every week. After each week, there's an anonymous peer review. Right? I mean, think about it from our perspective, right? So we're setting you off. You're going to do 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 a, a team-based work, and then January 15, you're coming back presenting some to, something to us. How are we going to grade you, right? Because we are not. We are not looking at individuals on the teams when it comes to, to, to what are they producing. We're looking at what the team is producing. Right? So the, the people who know the best who's actually doing something are the team members themselves. Right? So you're going to have to submit weekly peer reviews. And the way they work is the following. You have two dimensions. And you have 20 virtual dollars in each dimension. So, so you get. $20 to divide among your fellow team members for with their technical contribution during the last iteration. And you get another $20 to distribute among them for their adherence to the Scrum, scrum process and the support of, of are, they, are they good citizens in the Scrum kind of world. Right? Uh, and examination is then, your grade is going to depend on, on, on the, how many dollars you collect from your peers during the course of this course, as well as the teachers, as our assessment of the actual output that you're producing. Right. And this has a, this is kind of an unusual way of, of, of uh, examining and grading. Uh, but let me tell you, I've used this for, I think, eight years here. And twice in eight years, I've had students come to me and complain about the grade they got. Right? They come, a couple of students have come to me and said, you know what, I, I did, I did, I did way, way better than average in my team. I said, you know, your peers don't think so. Right? So apparently you haven't. You have, not, you have not managed to convince your peers that you're actually contributing more than average on this team. It's just the way it is. Right? And then that is, unless there's some, some exception that grade is the, way, the grade you're getting. So there's no conversation about the grade afterward. You can come and complain. You can do that. Uh, and it might help. Who knows? You know? uh, but but kind of consistently, uh, uh, the students have been, been, been satisfied with the grade they get, feel that it's a, sa it's a fair grade. And to, to, to just give an example of this, uh, so say that you're on a team with, with, with six other people. Right, Peter, Gustav, etc. Right, and after one iteration, you feel that Peter really contributed essentially one third of the technical work in this iteration. Seven out of, of, of you get seven out of your twenty virtual dollars in the technical uh, 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 dimension, and you fi feel like Veton, he didn't do anything from a technical perspective. He did, he did what he was supposed to do to, to make sure that the scrum, scrum process was followed. Uh, <coughs> but, but technically, he didn't do anything at all. So, so this, this is, in, in your subjective opinion, he hasn't made any technical contribution. Your subjective opinion. And you, you know what? We take all these subjective opinions together, just like rating systems on, on, a, on eBay or Amazon or whatever you have, enough data it's actually pretty, it tends to be pretty accurate, right? And uh, another example that Gustav, uh, yeah, so he excelled in Scrum, but has been about average from a technical perspective. Any questions about that? Rules for the peer reviews. Uh, it must be filled out the day after a sprint, sprint review, meaning the end of the iteration is a sprint review. Either that day or the next day you need to submit it. Uh, if you fail to submit, you get zero dollars. Right? Because if other people have given you dollars and you fail to submit, you shouldn't have any dollars. 
right? Because you haven't really told them what you think of them, right? So your dollars will be zeroed out. So missing to submit is bad news. It's the same as getting zero in that iteration. You don't want to do that. Uh, also, if you fail to submit or receive p poor reviews for two consecutive uh, sprints, we will gi give you a warning. Right? And if you don't improve, you're out. So, that's, so when you get this warni warning, think of that as, as failing the first exam. Right? You get a makeup exam. Uh, and if you, if you continue to do OK, you'll be OK. That warning, is, it, warning will not be held against you at the, when it comes to your end grade. Right? It will indirectly, since probably you have not received so many dollars from your peers. Right? So that will affect it. Right? But, uh, but just, just be diligent about this. And gaming of peer reviews will result, result in a warning. And you might ask, how do we know if you're gaming your peer reviews? Because the, 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 the idea is that you are brutally honest. And it's, it's your subjective opinion. Nobody's going to ask you, why did you give $5 to that guy and $2 to that one? We are not going to ask you. Those two guys are not going to know, because it's anonymous. So, and, and you know, we, we, we've seen this, I've seen this so many times now that, that uh, you know, people who are not pulling their weight, they tend to give dollars to other people who are not pulling their weight. You know, you, uh, you know I rob my, your back and you rob mine. But those who are doing really well are not giving any dollars who do, who those, to those who are not performing at all because they carry all the weight, right? So you see a division of the students in the team where here are these people who are not doing anything. They just give dollars to each other, <laughs> right? And then you know, right? If you see that one of the strongest people on the team gives zero dollars to one person in one iteration, while somebody else gives $10 to that person, you know, you know something is fishy, right? So we see that kind of stuff. So don't, don't even try. No point. Uh, any questions? So what's going what's to happen here now is that, that Lass is going to take over and talk about the project itself. And then when he's done, he is skipping town. And I will actually do the lecturing about project management, and in particular then uh, uh, Agile project management, in particular then Scrum for the rest of the day. Any questions right now? No. All right. So great. The reason why we're speaking English is that this uh, course is going worldwide. Uh, and if there are no people, um, uh, let me put it this way if there are only people who understand Swedish, I will switch over to Swedish during the, the Scrum iterations. So if there is anyone who doesn't understand Swedish, let me know. Uh, give me. Um, um, a shout out through mail or something or uh, Scrum. Oh, sorry, um, Slack or some other tool that we have. So this is um, this is the content that Ulla has already been talking about that, um, and that's that's us. Uh, and I will put this presentation on my Moodle as well, so you don't have to write this stuff off. Uh, so Ulla is the one who is the examinator, because I am from the industry. I am not allowed to be the examinator at all. So I, I know all the tricks, how to manipulate customers. And by that, I also know how to trick you. Remi just remember that, right? So uh, I will be the product owner. I will also be the, uh, the mentoring guy. So if you are the scrum master, you can call me anytime you like. You know? Just uh, if you do it during the night, I will not answer. So that's, that's fine. And this is the communications, and I think you already know that the the Slack channel is there. Uh, I made 
I made a few notes about that on my Moodle. So the project. So this is, uh, this is going to be really, really confusing because we have been talking about peer review. But the project itself is going to be a peer reviewing system. So don't confuse this thing I'm talking about today with, with what you are supposed to do after each iteration. So uh, if it is confusing, uh, I'll talk about that on, on Wednesday or Friday, all right? So what you're supposed to do is a peer reviewing system. And it might sound quite easy. But if you start to think about what peer reviewing is, uh, it is a tool for grading your team members, your friends. And Ulla has already been talking about gaming. So uh, one of the things that I want you to do is try to detect if someone is use using some kind of strategic grading. How is that going to work out? And also, there will be a few automatic warnings. Like if you are somehow receiving really bad grades for two weeks, then the system should somehow warn you as a student or as a team member. Because this system might be used uh, in the industry as well. This is actually ha has nothing to do with teaching. This is a team thing. So I, th I don't think this is that easy. Uh, and if you are looking at some of the um, sites on internet, they might look easy, but they are not. So don't look too much, right? Figure this out by yourself, right? And there are some other things you need to, to do. Because if we're going to use this system for real, which we are not, because uh, I don't actually know who is the owner of this at all. I might be a uh, linear university, but I have no idea. But in any case, you need to configure things. Because we have been talking about $20, uh, 20 for the scrum and 20 for the technical perspective. So what, to, what if we use, uh, let's say, three different ways of grading you, or four, or just one. So that's a configuration thing. And what if we don't want to use $20 as a base? And also, if we're talking dollars, perhaps that's bad. Perhaps I want to talk, I'm talking Swedish kronor. Or if we're using bitcoins, I have no idea what, the, uh, what kind of value that is. So there's a lot of configuration going on here. I also need a way for adding team members, adding teams, adding projects, and all that stuff. And we also have to we really have to make a decision of whether we're going to use a, a web application or if we're going to use this thing on an Android app or an or a should I dare say an Apple machine? So what you need to do here is to try to figure things out right now. Are we going in that direction or are we going to into that direction? Well, there's one guy who understands this, and that's me, because I'm the product owner. But on the other hand, I haven't figured this out myself. I will do that during the course of the project. So what I am telling you right now might not be the truth in the end. So I am very good at changing my mind. So but don't don't get um, don't get me wrong here. This will be just fine when we're done with this. You will hopefully, and I recommend this, when after with the first sprint, just take a few moments and, and reflect over what you've done. And during the last iteration, do, this, do the same thing. 
reflect over what has actually happened over the few iterations we have here. How furiously bad you felt during the first sprint, because you will. And how furiously good you feel during the last sprint. This is kind of like a psychology uh, lecture. So on Thursday at 10 o'clock, I will have a total full presentation of the project. So I, I'll try to I'll try to draw some stuff on uh, on my computer. I'll try to give you a few user stories, and I will tell you what is user story is and what it's for. Have a look at my Moodle because I will I will post a link there to a Zoom meeting. All right. And I know that there are some of you who does not like Zoom at all, but Zoom it is. So the teams. Well, there will be, uh, like, it's divided into two things here. That's the development team, and there's the Scrum Master. So each group will have one Scrum Master, and you will have to decide among your team members who that person will be. The team members will be developing. But the thing is here, in, in, a, in an ordinary Scrum, uh, scrum project, the Scrum Master is kind of the person who is paving the way for the rest of the team and usually doesn't do that much development. But in this case, the Scrum Master will develop as well. So it's, it's a kind of a, uh, a mixture of, of, uh, of different things here. The problem we have here is that we don't know what you actually do. We don't know, we don't get what your what your technical capabilities are. So, we have created a, a cross-functional form, which I urge you to uh, fill in, because I'm asking a few questions, such as are you any good at backend programming, or do you know how to manage a database, or are you a super expert at user interface? Uh, design. And that's a subjective thing too. If you think you are really good, well then you have graded you as an expert. If you think you're really bad, then you grade yourself as a, as a, a an unknowledgeable person. Based on what you do in that form, I will try to compose teams. And there will be somewhere around eight persons in each team. It depends. And that means that you who are sitting here in Kalmar will most likely be put into different teams. And I should also remind you that it's a, it's a course uh, that is about agile uh, development. So uh, even though I'm talking about more or less machine learning here, uh, that's not the case. Just relax. It's an agile course even though you're supposed to develop a system, OK? So I want you to um, fill in that functional form before Wednesday, 8 o'clock in the morning, Swedish local time, OK? So that Scrum Master. There will actually be two. We will be switching Scrum Master uh, mid-project. And who these two are, that's, uh, that's for you to decide among your teams. Um, the only thing here is that if you're a Scrum Master, you are allowed to call me if you have a problem with your team. So there is a mentoring. Um, I'm providing you with a, uh, a mentoring service. So when you're Scrum Master, just call me if you have a problem. 
because being a scrum master sometimes can be uh, uh, tedious. There's a lot of uh, psychology involved here. The problem here is not the technology, and this is almost a general rule. Uh, the problem is humans, and particularly communications. It's really, really hard to communicate the right thing at the right moment. Extremely hard. Almost all failures I've been involved in has had communications as a, as a root cause. OK, so when we're talking as a Scrum Master and a mentor, you, we can use any channel we like. We can use Slack, or we can use Skype, or we can use Zoom, or whatever you feel like. Just, just give me a call, and we will start talking. All right. And the product owner meetings. Well, that's with me because I'm the product owner. And and with there will be a weekly meeting, like a sprint review. And I usually put these on Fridays. So on Fridays. I will walk through each team, and it I will. It will be an, an hour, or so. The first two sprints will uh, have like an, an hour and a half or something like that because th we have a lot of things to talk to, and you have a lot of questions regarding Scrum itself. So, if that is okay, I will have these sprint reviews on Fridays. Is that okay, right? And we can use Skype if you want to. Uh, last year we used Slack a lot, so let's let's just uh, uh, figure out this. Just give me a call. Uh, since there will be, uh, I think, like f f five or six uh, um, different teams, uh, I will put up a schedule for you, so you know which team will be. Um, on what time, OK? And the sprint planning is something that is uh, performed after the sprint review. So when you, uh, I mean, Ulla will talk about sprint reviews and sprint plannings and all that stuff and retrospectives. But when you have shown me what you've done, we will have a sprint planning. And that's what when we talk about what you're supposed to do next week during the next sprint. So the review and the planning will take place at the same time, which is not that uncommon. And that's, uh, that's the same date as Ulla had a few minutes ago. That's, that's good. So these are the two points I want you to remember. The cross-function questions, and I will present the project on Thursday at 10 o'clock. I will record, so if you don't have the time to attend, you will have the possibility to look at it afterwards if you, if you want to. And also, uh, this, uh, the teams. Uh, I will present the teams as soon as I can possibly can after after Wednesday. OK? Just to relax. This will be just fine. Or? No. OK. That's it. Right. Unless you have a question, of course. No. Thank you. I can't. Since. Uh, just a bit. Yes, so yeah, I realized I started to speak English, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the only thing, only way I can understand him. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Oh, 
weird you know if I look for myself there I can't see myself and I move a little bit I can see right off maybe I'll make it a little bit better importance of feedback uh, yeah so I will essentially deliver three lectures to you today and squeeze together a little bit uh, and the first part here is I wouldn't say that any of it is super exciting right but the first part in particular is probably the least exciting part because you know I need to kind of go through the grind of of how this has been done in the past and kind of to to you know, 10 years ago, this was much easier because then a lot of people that you encounter that, ha that actually spent time doing building software in a traditional way. And so when you present them with a new way, they can have something to relate to. I say, yeah, you know, we had these problems here, and this might solve those problems. If you've never experienced the problems, it's hard to, to see the beauty of the new solution. So I will, I will expose some of the problems. You actually s can appreciate a little bit of the solution here. Uh, so I will first tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, and then we'll talk about what is a project. It's going to be a lot of words on these slides, a lot of words, a lot of pretty long words, too. Uh, what is project management? What is the project life cycle? A little fake case study. Why is it so hard? Because you know, it's a sad. It's a sad state of affairs. Like as a uh, as a professional group of people, we are awful at delivering. Absolutely horrendous. Right? And we talk a little bit. About why? Why is it so hard? And then look at the modern methodologies. We're gonna which gonna take us into this agile stuff. So who am I? I? I have a PhD in computer science from, uh, from Lund uh, in theory, like in data structures and algorithms. Uh, when, I, when I did my PhD studies, I didn't write a single line of code. But I'm more of a mathematician. right? So, so if you look at my thesis, it's theorems and pr proofs. It's, it's you can see some code snippets to, to convey something, but it's essentially theory. Uh, and then I met my, my, my now wife, uh, and uh, she's from, she was from, uh, from the US, Chinese, but from the US. Uh, she was in Europe at the time. And, and uh, I was a professor in Sweden, and, and I said to her, you know, I can offer you a life in, in southern Sweden. And she said, nah, you know, I think I'll pass. I, I go back to New York City. I said, OK. So what about me then? And she said, well, you know, you find a way. So I, uh, I applied for a research grant and received it. And so I got two years of research anywhere I wanted in the world. It could be at any university. I need to be at some university somewhere. So I was at Columbia University in, in New York City for, for two years. So that was my way of getting, getting my ass over there. Uh, then after a year, my, uh, my, my visa ran out. So, so we got married. You know, It's like one of those green card thingies, right? Uh, <laughs> would, would I got married anyway? Not right then, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, but it would have happened. Uh, and, uh, and I spent two years in academia in, uh, uh, doing research in New York. And then I ran out of money. So I needed to decide, well, what am I going to do now? Because New York is an expensive place to, to live. And uh, <laughs> so I was thinking, should I continue in academia? And I think, nah, you know, this, 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 
this internet thing might be something. We're talking about 95. Right? This internet thing might be something. Not clear at the time. Right? You, you kind of you realize it, this is a new technology. Something is going to is going to happen here. I realized that also had a, had, a, had a foresight to realizing that the interesting stuff is not going to happen in academia. Interesting stuff is going to happen in industry, in the private sector. Because essentially, they just invested all this money to develop this commutation technology for taxpayer money, and then they handed it over to the commercial forces. Right? And it just took off. Right? So I was thinking, yeah, you know, maybe that might be something, the internet. Not clear back then. You know something was going to happen, but you did not really understand the extent of it. Nobody did. Which is actually, actually also one of the reasons we are, we, we are facing a lot of problems now with the internet when it comes to, to privacy, to anonymity. These kind of things should have been built in from the, from the beginning, from the infrastructure of the internet. Now everybody has to do that by themselves, and we know how that goes. Right? So it wasn't taken seriously enough. right? The, 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 I would say the authorities didn't take it seriously enough as, as, a, as a tool that would change people li people's lives forever. Right? So, so the internet seemed, seemed like something interesting that was happening. Right? So I think, OK, how, how do I get in on that? Uh, I was a theoretician. I, I had no practical skills whatsoever. Right? I had nothing to offer the private sector. So, so I picked up a book on Java. There were two books at the time. Two, can you imagine this? There were two books on Java. And the book that I picked up was a book where each page was dedicated to an applet. Because that was, that was the beginning of Java, right? We're going to write it on the server side, and they're going to run everywhere on the client side. So it was like a, 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 a rich technology for the client side. That was kind of the idea in the beginning. Right? And uh, so I spent you know, a few months studying Java. It was an alpha at the time. I was not even out of alpha. Uh, and then I started to sell myself in New York as a Java programmer. Right? And nobody knew it, but everybody heard of it. Right? So there was nobody who could kind of interview me on, 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 on this. Nobody could assess if I had any skills at all that was valuable to them. Right? Uh, <laughs> and I ended up with a company that, that was, was just a big Russian uh, theoretical, theoretical physicist who kind of took pity in me. I was thinking, you know, he's a smart guy, you know, has a PhD in algorithms, can use him somehow, right? And so I spent a couple of years, uh, or rather, I spent a few months doing coding. At the, at the time, I considered myself one of the world experts on JavaScript at the time, right? I, well, I wrote self modifying JavaScript in 1996. There was, there was nothing that, like that happening back then. So it was fun. And then kind of my t career took off, right? I, I, I no longer co started co uh, no longer coded. They wanted to have me in management, in architect roles, design roles, and that kind of stuff. And, and it just took off. Uh, so I started a couple of companies there. I was in the internet industry in New York for 14 years. Started a couple of companies. I was the chief technology officer for several companies. And, uh, and uh, I ended up at a company called DoubleClick. DoubleClick was the... Uh, they're barely known anymore. Uh, the brand still exists, as a matter of fact. Uh, DoubleClick was the, the first internet advertising technology company. So it was the first company that, you know, I I back in the mid-'90s, when the first websites started to come up, one of the first ones was Wired, Wired Magazine, had a website. And they realized that this is their content. They need to monetize, be, find a way to monetize their content if they publish it online the same way they can monetize the content if they print it in, ma in a magazine. Right? So they realized, we need advertising solutions. But they also realized that we don't know anything about advertising solutions, the technology for advertising on a website. So in comes DoubleClick and says, we take care of that for you. We take care of the serving of the ads. The we even can take care of the, of, of the selling of the ads on your website. So full service. You just provide us with with slots where we can put ads, and we figure out a way to monetize those slots for you. So you actually can get some money from for other content that you're publishing. Right? Uh, I was a double click for, for in, in two rounds. And, uh, and then in 2007, I think, uh, 
we were we were a publicly traded company, uh, and then you know the market turned to shit. So we were bought back by private equity companies. We were no longer publicly traded. Uh, didn't know what was going to happen. And then we started to hear the rumor, and I had started to see it already, because uh, at the time I was I was uh, vice president of engineering at at DoubleClick, and. I started to see Google moving into the space of, 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 of display advertising, you know, these display ads, right? Google was already doing the paid search and that kind of stuff, right? Uh, AdSense, I don't know if that existed yet. Uh, but so I saw they were doing it on, on by, by analyzing uh, 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 web pages, right? By analyzing the source code of web pages. They, they were dabbling in that, uh, but they couldn't do it. They failed to do it, uh, not because they're not smart enough, but I think primarily because Google at the time was only addressing the long tail, only small mom and pop shops. They had no idea how to do business with Coca-Cola, like a big, big brand who was willing to spend millions and millions on advertising. That was not Google. They were not set up to deal with big customers. DoubleClick had done that since the mid '90s, so we had that down. So they bought us for the kind of the know-how on the business side, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we heard, we heard, we, so, so I'd seen them, seen them coming to, uh, into this market, and then we heard rumors that there was a bidding war for us. And it was Google, it was Microsoft, and Yahoo were bidding for for for, for DoubleClick at the time, and the bidding started at. At, uh, and at 2.1 billion dollars, and and neither one of them wanted the other one to get us. It was more about that. So the bidding went up to 3.1 billion dollars, and it was sold to Google. So I end up at Google, and there, so responsible for like 150 technical people, uh, I was responsible for implementing agile project uh, management across the organization. Uh, and then in 2009, I left Google, and uh, I, I moved from 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 Brooklyn to uh, to to Vexra, and uh, and people are scratching their heads, you know, really, why would you do that, you know? And, and I knew my daughter at the time; she was four, so she didn't really understand it. But I knew one day she would, the question would come, you know, what were you thinking? Uh, but you know, we, we 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 are different stages of life. Simply, right? I, I I had been in New York for 16 years at the time. I was I was done with with that kind of life. It's a fast paced. You work hard, play hard, meet your wife for dinner at the restaurant at nine o'clock, have a few martinis. You go home with a slight headache, and you're up the next morning at seven o'clock, and you're into the office and. And they pay you well, but it's just a grind and high pressure all the time, always in a rush, always. You walk down to the subway platform, there's no way you would stop when you get down to the platform. You walk to the place that's closest to the exit where you're going to get off the subway, because that way you save seconds. And you never know. Those seconds might, as I say, time is money in the US, right? So, so I was done with that life. Right? And and also I had a three year old a four year old daughter and, and, and I wanted her to to grow up in Sweden. I, I wanted her to I wanted the Swedish Swedish values to be to be ingrained in her. I wanted her to be a kid for a little bit longer. We had friends there who, who whose whose uh, whose kids at the age of four or five were, were going to therapists, right? I wanted her to, to learn how to ski and skate rather than use a a, a, a subway pass. Right? To, to somehow somehow get closer to Mother Nature. And I also had a realization one day there where I asked myself, did I touch or walk on anything today that was not man-made? And the answer was, not even close. And it didn't feel good. Right? I, I, we, we lived in an apartment, you know, in a box suspended in the sky. Isolate myself from the elements. Isolate myself from Mother Earth. If it rains, it doesn't matter because I walk under some roof or something like that. Full, 
if it's hot outside, I have AC inside. If it's cold outside, I have heat inside. Everything I do, kind of trying to trying to minimize Mother Earth's ability to get in the way of my business, right? As as if she needs to adjust somehow to me, you know. So so it didn't feel good. So so moved to Sweden. I was here for uh, to to Linnaeus University. I was here for. Uh, for a few years, and then I started to itch, started a company, uh, but uh, that failed, uh, which most of them do, and that's okay. And so I came back to academia, back for a couple of years, and then a year ago, essentially, I, I moved to, uh, to, to Redwood City, which is in uh, kind of the northern tip of Silicon Valley. Uh, it's 30 kilometers uh, south of, uh, of San Francisco. So I'm there now. Uh, and I've still been employed here, coming back here, giving courses and, and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know how long that will continue, though, because I'm not here. I'm there. Any questions? You can talk to me later if you want to learn something about these. It's been an interesting ride, being a filthy rich on paper one day and then poor the next day. It was like that like that but I, I'm not not a regretting a second of it you know it's great great experience all right so that was the uh, that was the entertaining part of this <laughs> of this morning's presentation so uh, oh yeah so, so that's why I speak English I don't speak Swedish really I understand Swedish I can speak Swedish it is my native language my active vo vocabulary is pretty poor uh, even here, during my nine years in Sweden, I barely spoke English because my wife doesn't speak Swedish, essentially. Uh, my daughter, I only speak English with my daughter. She learns Swedish anyway in, in school and so on. And at the university, in Växjö at least, I would say more than 50% of my colleagues there are, are, are non-Swedish speakers. So, so, and I think I've given one lecture in nine years in Swedish since I came here, because there's always somebody who doesn't speak Swedish around these days. So that's why I didn't think about it before. <laughs> uh, so, so what's a project? So it's a temporary endeavor to accomplish something. Right, so it has some goals, requirements, a scope, or whatever you want to call it. It has a time frame. And this is the biggest, this is, this is a big one. A project is it is not business as usual. It has a time frame. So not everything is project-based out there. A lot of work is not project-based. It has some resources, people associated with it. Uh, somebody owns it. Somebody higher up in the organization owns it. Uh, actually, that's the executive sponsor. Yeah, somebody, some, somebody, somebody needs to be responsible for it. And it has some form of budget. Now, project management. It's a discipline of achieving the project goals while adhering to the constraints. Right? So this, this is just words that I think make, you know, the message makes a lot of sense. There's nothing strange here. Uh, so some aspects of project management, establishment of clear and achievable goals, often a problem. Uh, planning, organizing, securing, managing resources, balancing demands. Scope, quality, time, and cost, always fighting against each other. Uh, communicate about the project. Uh, the biggest challenge here, as Lasse was alluding to before, is uh, human beings. It's by, by far the, the biggest problem in project management. Because, you know, <laughs> we are emotional and we get sick. And, you know, our kids get sick. You know, you cannot predict our behavior, really. And then changing and incomplete requirements. So typical organization, you have a CEO, you have sales and marketing, finance, product management, engineering, uh, technology, and typically project management. The management of projects done within engineering department are typically managed within the engineering department. So now, who initiates projects? 
Well, typically it's product management. Uh, because it's their job. Product management's job is to know, to keep their eyes on the ground, right? To know what the customers need. Right? So typically, new ideas come from them because they're supposed to listen to the customers all the time. Uh, sometimes it could be internal projects. Sometimes it could be that you know the, the finance department sees that you know if we roll these numbers up differently and count this differently, it's better for us. We might be able to save something. So that initiated within within the within another department, or it could be engineering that says you know uh, if we do this, we'll be able to save you some money on that later on. But typically, it's it's it, it's it's the product side. All right, so brace yourself. So the typical, the traditional project life cycle looks like this. There's some form of initiation of what you're going to do. And we're going to go through all these in, 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 in painful detail in examples in a little bit. Uh, so it's an initiation. There's some form of planning. And then you actually do it. And then you complete it. So in the initiation, you ask the question, the yeah, question why is that? What, what's the business value of this? Because if there's no business value, you're not going to be allowed to do it, sadly. Right? And, and the closer that business value, the, the more, the closer you can associate that business value with money, the, the higher the chances that the project is going to happen. If if the, 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 if, if the intention is to improve employee morale, it's going to be way harder to sell it, to, to be able to do it, right? because the, the money is an indirect effect of higher morale. Uh, <laughs> you confirm sponsorship. Who's, who's, who higher up is gonna is, is says that we should be doing this? Because if you don't have somebody way up in the organization who's, who, who says that, yes, we should be doing this, then if somebody else up there in the organization thinks of a project uh, and they see a team sitting there, they think, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have them do my project, right? So you need to have somebody up there to essentially protect you from, from uh, other ideas and, 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 and disruptions. Uh, you confirm the scope. Some assumptions. You engage stakeholders, which means executive, users, customers, suppliers, whoever is interested in this. You draft some high-level plan, and you figure out: Do we need any services for this from the outside? You know, if 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 you're thinking of one team that should be doing it, do they need services from the outside? Because you might ha not have all the the, uh, the 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 skills on the team. Uh, second phase is planning, so one more kind of level of detail d deeper when it comes to scope and requirements. Try to figure out how is it going to be accomplished, who's going to do it. Uh, preliminary staffing, schedule, budget, risks, and some form of plan for communication. Execution, well, you execute, you build your system or whatever it is. Uh, while you do it, you communicate how it's going to, to those who are interested in this. Uh, you monitor your progress. Make sure that, because you, know, you have some form of plan how it's going to work. Uh, you track any changes that are coming in. And you keep the plan up to date. And then you complete the project, which means that you have some form of project review with the stakeholders, with those who are interested in this. Uh, you develop some form of handover plan, because typically, is not the same people responsible for maintaining something as the people who develop it. Typically, you have junior people maintaining stuff. That's how they kind of learn. And then you have some form of retrospective. Try to figure out what can we learn from this project. Is there anything that you know went well? Anything that didn't go so well? Should we modify anything for future projects? And then you can actually think of of the. Uh, the systems development life cycle almost inside of the execution and control where you're building things here. Because this has nothing to do kind of with technology, and this is all technology. 
So we're going to do a little fake example here, which is dear to my heart, as a matter of fact. Uh, so Sergey Brin, so one of the founders of Google, he would like, here's this idea one day, that he would like for users to be able to set aside search results in a basket and access them at the later stage. And, and the motivation here is that, that say that you are on a knowledge acquisition pursuit. Say that you want to build a wooden sailboat. Build a, you have this idea, I want to build a wooden sailboat. So you consult Google, how do I build a wooden sailboat? Right? And you find a, a lot of resources, right? a lot of links to interesting st stuff that might be interesting. But you're not in a position right now to read each one of those. Right now, you're just collecting information and at the later stage, you're actually going to process, massage this information and see what's useful for you out of this information. So it's not a hit and run search. It's not like, because you think about it, this is the paradigm that Google is still, still using. The, the assumption is that the use case is the following. You have some question you want an answer to. You initiate a session with Google. You might modify, you might you do some, 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 some Boolean, Boolean uh, uh, search terms and stuff to prune the result set, essentially. You do an initial query, then you start to prune this result set. Uh, and then you find your answer, and then you're done. That's, 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 that's Google. Right? Google doesn't help you at all with managing any of your information. It helps you find a piece of information, but it's not life is not always that easy. <laughs> that 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 you only want, want one piece of information, and then you're done, right? It's a bigger context. Right? When I start to ask people about this, how do you do this, right? What do you do? Well, you know, I open up these in different tabs, right? Because I don't want to read them now, so I see these different tabs, right? And now I have 15 tabs. Okay. I guess I could save them as bookmarks or favorites or whatever it's called in different browsers. But how do you like the management tools for favorites and bookmarks? They're not, right? It's just not done for this kind of effort, for building a knowledge base about something. Right? Uh, so, so when I ask people, you know, many of them, you know, they save the links in a text document or in, in a Word document or something. It's just it's insane this day and age, you know? And if you think about search, think about search, the, the interface for search has been the si same since 95. It's one box in the middle. And you have a question, and you're not supposed to translate that question into words which you type in. It's so primitive, right? Say that I want to know, say I want to know who designed that chair. I'm out of luck, right? Yeah, I can do an image search maybe, but we know how the colors are affected by the photo I take of this. So the chances of Google being able to help me find the design of that chair close to zero. So there's a lot of work left in search. People just don't, we kind of been, been fooled into thinking that it's done. Right? It's, it's so far from done. Or if I'm out in the forest picking mushrooms and I see, I see a mushroom on the ground, I want to know what mushroom is that. Well, you know, it would be much easier to answer that question if you took into account how big is the mushroom? What time of the year is it? Where are you? All of a sudden, you know, you could prune the potential result set into almost nothing. Right? Can't be done today. Right? So using different modalities as input to a search engine. Right? It's and I actually spoke to, I met uh, a, a, three weeks ago, 
the guy who was actually for 10 years he was responsible for the search page the search result page at Google I met, I met him and, 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 and talked to him about this and said yeah you know it's it's, it's it's not there yet within this paradigm that you have one search field and you give me search results within that paradigm Google is fantastic but as one paradigm and I think actually as a matter of fact I mean the the voice assistants are kind of trying to make a little bit of, of, of attacking that area but if you think about it if you search on Google the way Google makes money is by showing you many links well if what if Google knows the answer to your search it's not in their interest to give you the answer. Is there in their in their interest to give you a link? So you click on that link to get the answer, right? So, yeah, I have a lot of grievances when it comes to when it comes to to, to, to search. Anyway, so so that that's kind of the 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 uh, my uh, my uh, 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 fake background to to Sergey Brin's request here for 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 a basket of search results. So so we're going to go through this. Uh, as a as a project, given that uh, the four the four different steps. So initiation, what's the business value? Well, Sergey says that users want this, and if we give them what they want, we make more money on ads. And guess what? It's not that far from the truth. That's kind of you know I have this this love hate relationship with Google, uh, but they are they're like a razor sharp focus on what's good for the end user, right? It was even a few years ago, uh, you know, they constantly change their, uh, their uh, uh, the search algorithms, looking for different, as they call signals, to determine what's, what, what, are, what are the best results for this. And, and a few years ago, one of the signals that they introduced was response time of the site, not the Google site, but response time of the links that it gives you. It gives you a bunch of search results. So no, it was no longer just giving you those search results in the original order, but it also take, took into account how fast is the site are those sites responding. Right? And the thinking was that, well, you know, what's good for the, Google, for, for the users is good for us. It's good for Google. Right? So some of these search results changed right and unfortunately uh, is those with resources who are most capable of having a fast response time right so it's kind of discrimination against small sites right most people don't know this right this is the kind of shit that Google sh can change overnight and 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 as a result small businesses might ju just if you in effect, just disappear from the face of the earth, right? They were there before in the top search results. Now a new signal comes in, and they're gone, right? That's so you're completely at at the, at the mercy of the big Google. Uh, oh, here's another funny story. Actually, uh, I was at the at the at an all hands meeting with with when Eric Schmidt, the uh, the he was then the CEO of Google, uh, and he actually said, he said, he said, guys, we, we found a way to legally print money. That's what Google is doing. They're printing money. And we're doing it legally. It is it's just unbelievable. Right? And, and you should keep that into account sometimes when you think about Google, who's, <laughs> who's, who's providing you with all these fantastic services right, and, and everything looks free because you're the product, right? Uh, uh, but keep in mind that they found a cash cow, right? If you have something that can essentially finance anything you want to do, because you're just raking in the cash over here, you can throw shit out and see if it sticks. If it doesn't stick, no big deal. We wasted $10 million, no big deal, irrelevant. So, so they found a cash cow, and it's easy to experiment and innovate if you have a cash cow. It's more difficult if you need to worry about the daily, daily bread and butter. Uh, okay. 
I will get sidetracked a lot. <sighs> so the executive sponsor is Sergey Brin. A scope allow users to set aside search results to to replace the delay the time. Stakeholders, well, it's essentially everybody. Uh, resources, well, we need some some developers, we need some QA analysts, UI designers, usability folks, and some translators because we can roll this out in the whole world at the same time, or 20 languages, or whatever they is a minimum they have. Uh, so that was that was kind of planning initiation, and here's planning. So the scope, so we put a button next to each search result that allows the user to add that result to a basket. Uh, this is mock-up, right? So it's <laughs> and uh, the basket should support, we should be able to view everything, and we should be delete, or we should empty all the items in this, in this basket. Uh, schedule, we start on the 25th of November, and we finish the, it's the December 1st. Uh, milestones. Uh, it should take us like a week to get the buttons on the search results page. Uh, give us another two weeks that so we have the basket functionality. We should have that done. Another two weeks, usability testing should be complete. A couple of weeks later, translation, some integration testing, some performance testing, and then we should be able to deliver on, on the 1st of December. Uh, more planning. How are we going to do this? Well, the search UI engineering team would add the buttons. And we have somebody from Google Checkout. Do you know Google Checkout? Maybe, maybe it's called Google Pay now. Maybe that's a, a Google Checkout. It's kind of an interesting story, actually. Uh, so Google Checkout was a, a direct competitor to PayPal at the time. So you know, it's like 2005 or something like that. Right? And, uh, and I was told this story, that, uh, that uh, the product manager for, for Google Checkout when, when he demoed it to the founders, functionality, uh, he proudly says, said that, you know, and on this site, or these sites, we have an exclusive, meaning that PayPal is not there, but only Google Checkout. You can only check out with Google Checkout. And the founder said, that's not good. I said, what do you mean? Well, that's not good for, good for the users. What if, they ha what if they don't have Google Checkout? But they have PayPal. They should be able to check out anyway. <laughs> it seems like, really, I mean, from a business perspective, it would be great to have an exclusive, right? But yeah, there was still, at least back in back in those days, there was still that idealistic uh, thread going through the company somehow, right? Uh, I think that's gone now, unfortunately, uh, because. Not doing something is doing evil. You know, that was their mantra, right? Do no evil, Google. And uh, yeah, you don't actively do any evil, but we come to a stage now when not doing something is actually evil. And that's what they're doing. Uh, anyway, uh, budget, 30 full time employee months. Uh, risks, well, the checkout team is. is is busy right now. They might be running late. Uh, we haven't found any translation resources yet. How are we going to communicate that? Well, we're going to have wiki, weekly status reports to, 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 to Sergey and the, and the product managers. Uh, and then we execute. So we analyze from a technical perspective. We design, we implement, and we test, and we translate. And we have some form of tool that helps us manage the progress of the, of the project. Uh, this is typically Gantt chart. Uh, interestingly, this is like a, a, a Microsoft uh, Gantt chart. Interestingly, I was told that the team that built this at Microsoft used Agile, an Agile methodology to, to, to build some to build a tool that is not cannot be used in Agile, but is used for something else. I don't know if that's true though. It's a good story. Uh, okay. So completion, so we demonstrate this to Sergey, and we find the uh, maintenance and support folks, and then we deploy the feature to end users. So that's kind of a, 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 a project. Now, here's one we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So let's see what time it is. 
so this is John's web agency. So you see John up there, like, you know, really white teeth, the suit. And, uh, and so, so he started a web agency. And he likes, John, John likes money, right? That's why he started his agency. And he has uh, uh, six people employed, uh, two in customer support. And I'm, 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 I'm using these genders to just show you how messed up it is out there. Uh, people in customer support are two women, uh, Ebba and Malin. Uh, developers is Vlad and Fred. UI design and testing is Emma. And the database administrator and responsible for operations is Tom. Right? This, is, this, is, this is what they look like out there. And I so wish we could do something about this. Uh, so, yeah, so John, as I said, he likes money, right? So, so he's always looking for new business opportunities. And then when returning from lunch one day, he has this fabulous idea. There are five restaurants where, where uh, John is regularly frequenting. Uh, and but how does he know which one to go to? Right? He's setting out at, at or in Sweden, right? So he's setting out at 11.10 for lunch, right? Uh, <laughs> make sure he gets a table. Uh, and and uh, so how does he know which one to go to? Well, he could check the restaurant's websites, right, and see what the daily special is, is for that day. But you know, he doesn't want to go to five different websites and look at it. It might not even be up to date. Right? And so he would like to have access to, to this information in one place. Well, you could pick up a, a copy of the local paper on Monday, right? And you could tear out that page where, where the daily specials are. But you know, John is not doing that. You know, he doesn't walk around with a piece of newspaper in his pocket, you know? Uh, so he says, let's build a service that does this. So you're going to go through these steps again for this project. So scope and assumptions. Uh, so restaurants, they should be able to enter their daily special to some web UI. Uh, customers should be able to select which restaurants they're in interested in receiving information from. And every Monday morning, an email is sent to customers informing them of the lunch specials of the restaurants for that week for the restaurants that they have selected. You get one email per week, because typically here it's the same lunch special every day. Uh, anyway, so uh, you get one email per week. Now I have this in, in electronic form. Right? Uh, John has already spoken to a few restaurants, and they are very interested. You know, he's, he, he knows how to sell. And uh, restaurants should have to authenticate, but ideally customers should not have to authenticate. We don't know we want to bother people with another password or whatever it is. Uh, what is the business value? Well, we're charging restaurants a fee for including their offerings. But more importantly, we're actually creating a one-to-one -one marketing channel between the restaurants and the customers. And this could be leveraged later on for something. We don't know. Uh, sponsorship and funding, well, John is the sponsor of this. He's, he's the instigator and the sponsor. And, uh, and, and there's almost nothing done ha happening right now. So apart from some maintenance, the whole team is available. His entire team is available to work on this. Engage the stakeholders, well, John is engaged, as always. Uh, we need to identify individuals and restaurants Indi individuals at restaurants as well as some customers to, 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 to run this by and see what we're going to build uh, to get some, input, some, some requirements. And so a high level plan would be that you know, we pitch this to all downtown restaurants, we gather requirements from end users, we build a, we build a web UI for restaurants, we build a web UI for configuration for, for customers, and then we build a list management and email execution somehow because this needs to be Store in a database, needs to pull out a database, and emails need to be sent and managed and all that stuff. 
Okay. Uh, second phase, uh, second second stage here, planning. So long, one level deeper uh, in, in 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 the requirements. Uh, so for restaurants, we said a web UI authentication. Uh, restaurants should be able to sign up a customer's email address. So restaurants should be able to sign up a customer. Think of that like you know somebody. You can put your business card in that big vase, right, at the counter in the, in, at the restaurant. And if you do that, you kind of ad, ad, agree to that. You, you can be added to, to the email distribution list or whatever. Uh, for customers, we said some web UI without authentication, ideally. Uh, customers should be able to make an update selections that they've made, and they should be able to unsubscribe from the whole thing. Uh, internal, well, we need to deal with this email sending. How do we do email sending? How do we send emails in bulk? How do we do that? We don't know how to do that. Uh, open questions. How do we avoid authentication for, for end customers, end users? Uh, can restaurants see who selected them? Open question. What about bounds and open rates? You know bounds and open rates for emails? So if you send an email, uh, I want to know if it reached the, the recipient or not, right? And if it, if it, if it bounces, that means that it did not certainly did not reach the recipient. Uh, but if it reached the recipient, did they open it? Did they open the email or not? Well, maybe it ended up in a junk mailbox. How do I know that? I don't know that. Uh, whether it does or not, well, it depends. It depends on the email service provider, like uh, uh, Gmail, for example. Uh, uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's in Google's interest to provide you with a good user experience. Now, use, your user experience deteriorates if you perceive that you're getting a lot of, of spam, a lot of stuff that you don't want, right? So, 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 so Google is looking at the incoming emails, as you, as you know, and determining whether should they be put in the junk mailbox or should be put in the inbox or not, right? So they make an educated decision. Now, how do they make that decision, right? Well, it could depend on analysis of the actual content of email, right? But more importantly, it's based on, tend to these days be based on whether you clicked on it or not, right? So if you click on something that you consider being spam, you're essentially telling Google, give me more of that, right? So don't click on those nasty emails that you get <laughs> if you want to get rid of them. <laughs> Just don't click on them, right? But as a, as a, if, I, if I'm a service and sending out emails, you know, I want to obviously know if these emails were, were opened or not. Uh, and, and it could also be that, in general, if you were to send, try to send 10,000 emails to Gmail, a red flag will go up at Google and says, what is this? Right? This is a risk that this is a spammer. So you could also go, go whitelist yourself with Google. Right? You can apply to be whitelisted with Google in order to, to circumvent those problems. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to use PHP and MySQL because those are the technologies we know in the in the agency, and we have enough enough existing hardware infrastructure to to host this. Uh, the web UI for restaurants we're going to use SSL for security, simple authentication. Uh, we need some password policy functionality. Uh, we need a, a database of the offers. Uh, web UI for customers, database of selections, of subscription, and then uh, the email sending and list management again, which is, which is non-trivial. Non uh, budget, 11 person months, we're budgeting for this. And staffing, well, we have one and a half software engineers. We have one designer. We have half of Tom. 
Uh, we have half of Marlin's time as a tester, and then we have uh, John as a project manager. And we're going to start October 1st, and we're going to end January 1st. Milestones. So in a week, we should have requirements from end users. And we should also have the database schema. A week later, UI design should be done. Two weeks later, the restaurant UI should be functional. A week after that, the custom UI should be functional. Uh, week after that, email sending based on selection should be functional. A couple of weeks later, security aspects. Then functional testing, performance testing. And then finally, we make it available to friends and family for, uh, for a couple of weeks. And then we make it available for, 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 for everybody on January 1st. Now, what are the risks here? This I alluded to this before. Can we be viewed as spammers and end up in a bulk mail folder? Don't know at this point. Uh, we still need some design for requiring end users to not authenticate, or for not requiring end users to authenticate. So we start. And, and this is just a, a for a presentation to you. This is not a typically not the kind of uh, uh, document document you use for, for managing a project. It's not that far from it, though. So you see here, so we have all the, uh, all the, uh, all the big items here. So the requirements should start Jan October 1st and be done uh, seven day or six, six days later. Uh, we have the email here. So these are simply taken from the previous milestones that I showed you. So we're starting. And after a week into it, turns out that John is too busy. Right? John has not been able to gather all the requirements that we need. Uh, he's, he's about 50% complete. Uh, Tom being Tom, you know, because he knows what's going to happen anyway, because he's an operations guy. Right, so he, they, they, they always know. So he's already implemented a database schema, even though he doesn't, hasn't gotten all the requirements yet from, from, uh, from John. Uh, and Emma has started some, a little bit of design uh, for, the, for, the, for the UIs. But she's a little bit behind because what she expected to be, because John is behind. A week later, now John finished. He was five days late. 12th October. Uh, uh, Emma managed to finish the, the restaurant UI design, but now the custom UI design is behind, caused essentially by, by, by John's lag in the beginning there. Two weeks later, design is still not complete, but implementation starts anyway. Implementation of restaurant UI is now done, so that was done on time. But uh, design UI is, is now two weeks behind being finished. And, but implementation has already started anyway. Four weeks later, Vlad has been sick for a week. Right, so everything related to Vlad here is, is behind. You know, chances are, I mean, it's November, right? And chances are, you know, he has a kid at home, and then you get sick, right? So in November, people get sick. We didn't think about that when we planned this. Two weeks, two weeks ahead. Now, Fred has been sick for a week. Well, we get what he got it from, right? He got it from Vlad, who was sick. So he's been sick for a week. So consequently, his tasks here are not finished. So when we see this, we now, maybe we're going to launch to friends and family on December 22nd. So we now realize 15th of December, there's no way that's going to happen. Right? So we delay the launch until mid-January instead. Seventh of January. Well, now everything is done. 
but it turns out that there's some performance performance issues with the uh, with the with the restaurant UI. So the database needs some optimization. So we delay it another week. And on the 22nd of January, we demo it to, to John. The handover plan is that Marlin will take care of customer support, Vlad will be technical support, Tom will monitor resource usage, and Tom will also develop some internal reports for service usage statistics. So we know the usage of this. We know how many people are using it, how many restaurants are using it, whether people get the emails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the delay here cost four person months above budget. Four out of 11, right? So we, we're talking about like 36, 37 percent above budget for a, a three month project, right? And the scary thing is that this is fantastically good, right? So lessons learned. Don't rely on John only for requirements. Building some buffer for people getting sick. Attack the risky tasks earlier in the project. And only five restaurants are participating right now. We need to secure, next time we need to secure, secure more clients earlier on. So that's a uh, good timing. So, so we'll uh, let's take uh, 15 minutes here. Not dying now.
Should we start again? I just don't see the right image now on the monitor there. Camera has shifted. Any idea? Stream mixed. Okay. Mixed. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one thing I forgot to say before. So, uh, I said that, that I knew it was going to come back and bite me uh, when we left New York for Sweden. And so, after eight years in Sweden, my daughter is now, so she was four when we left New York. <coughs> so, after eight years in Sweden, she's 12, <coughs> she says, you told me that we moved to Sweden because grandpa had cancer and you wanted me to have a Swedish childhood. So yeah. So okay. Now grandpa is dead. Grandma is dead. And I've had my Swedish childhood. So what are we doing here? <laughs> it's just, just, it takes kids sometimes to just, just cut through all the, the bullshit. Somehow, and, I, and I realized that what she's really telling me without understanding is that, that the circumstances that made us move to Sweden no longer apply. And, and I have forgotten about that, you know, because you just get comfortable. And, and so we, I, I thought, you know, it's interesting. So it would be irresponsible not to take a step back and at least look at the situation because she's pointed it out that, you know, deserves another look. And uh, and then she so said, you know, maybe we stay, but then it needs to be an active choice of staying, not just because we're here already and it's convenient. And so we decided to leave. And uh, and so we announced to the world that we were leaving, and uh, we had no idea where we were going to go. And uh, so we were actually thinking first of moving to Berlin. We were thinking about Barcelona for a while. California was always kind of in the picture. Eventually, we'll end up there. We're going to throw in the towel in California one day. That, that's that's the idea. Still, still kind of the idea, I think. Uh, and then we just happened to end up in uh, in California. So it was like not not planned at all. But you know, listen listen to the kids, uh, as we do now these days. Uh, so enough about me. Favorite topic. Uh, so, IT projects. So, most IT projects fail. So the average IT project costs twice as much as budgeted, takes twice as long as planned, and has 65% of the functionality at completion. I mean, can you imagine, right? I mean, we are here like in the software organization, right? In, in, in the software department or the engineering department of, of, of our company, and, and they're working their asses off. I saw we. Uh, and I ask us, so can you do this? I say, yeah, sure. And then we fail to deliver again and again and again. I mean, how did they put up with us, right? So we had, so we have a bad reputation, really, and and uh, as a profession, and 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 rightfully so. You know, we, we we suck, right? We're getting better now, which is why 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 we're doing this course. It's even more bad news, like 62% fail to meet the schedule, 50% of higher than expected maintenance costs, and 41% fail to deliver the expected business value. And then, so here's some, this information comes from a, from a, from a, a survey that was done, I don't know, might be five years ago now. And so they asked also people, why? So this is like hundreds of companies, thousands of people interviewed for this. So I asked them, what are the, what, what, why, do, why do we fail? Top, top reason for failure, subjectively, was incomplete requirements. Okay. Second one, lack of user involvement. Third, lack of resources. Lack of executive support. Changing requirement. Unrealistic schedule. Poor communication. And then I asked them, okay, but those that, those that su succeed, those pro projects that succeed, why do they succeed? 
user involvement, executive support, clear business objective, being able to adjust the scope, agile process, and, and management expertise. So with that in mind, we will look at this again. Right? We have the initiation, the planning, the execution, and then the completion. Now, this way of doing things assumes a predictable world. It assumes that the requirements are known from the beginning. It assumes that the rest of the industry in which we operate grinds to a halt while we develop our new product or our new feature. It assumes that the stakeholders don't change their minds. They change their minds all the time. The higher up you are, the windier it is. The more they change their minds all the time. And it also assumes that the resources that we assign to this are, are available for the project. But guess what? If we're doing a new project and, 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 and the bread and butter operation of our business goes down, right, the ma our main product goes down, uh, they're going to take the best resources and throw at that problem. Because if we don't get that system up and running again, we cannot meet payroll next month. Right? So that's way more important than this project that you started off. Right? So resources will change. It's just, it's just the nature of the beast. This might work fine for some projects. I, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any projects where, where this way of doing things works. Now, iterative methodologies are a way of, of addressing the shortcomings of this traditional way of this, this kind of waterfall model, as it's sometimes called. Uh, so the motivation here is that requirements do change after the project starts. That turns, to be, turns out to, to always be true. And the world around us changes as well. So let's embrace this change. So in, in traditional methodologies, you set up to minimize the impact of change. You formulate the plan, and we go in that direction. If anything happens that deviates from this plan, we track those changes, and we have change management and stuff. But if most of the time is changes, then you spend most of your time on, on, on managing the changes rather than doing the actual work. I find, I find similarities between this and, and uh, and immigration, as a matter of fact. You know, we, when we got this, this big flow of, 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 of refugees to Sweden during the last, last few years, uh, we set up a change management process to, 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 to deal with these, this influx of, of new people coming into society, uh, thinking that we should not have to modify the way we live, we shouldn't have to modify our society, just try to figure out how to integrate this somehow. Well, I think that, that given how we treat Mother Earth, mass migration might be the norm rather than the exception. We're treating it, we set up to treat as an exception to the normal, normal state of affairs. Right? If we get more, if mass migration becomes more and more common, that becomes the normal state of affairs. So it doesn't serve us. To, 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 to act as if it's an exception, if it's not an exception anymore. Right? So if you have enough exceptions and enough changes, you're better off just throwing out the existing process and start with something that says, change is OK. Let's create something that, that works when there is change. So iterative methodologies work the following way. You take a chunk of functionality that you have in your product, your service, whatever it is. And you do some planning, figure out what you need to do, analyze, you implement it, you test it, you evaluate it, and you check, you check is this good? One piece of functionality. Right? You do not move on to the next piece of functionality until this piece is done. 
right? So stuff that you haven't started to deal with yet in your software development can change anything you want because you haven't, it's not affecting you at all, right? So as an example of this, uh, Leonardo, he was asked to paint Mona Lisa. And so he makes a sketch and he asks, will this work? And the, uh, the, the buyer, the, the one who commissioned it, says, no, she must be turned left. Right? Well, it's a good thing he didn't finish, right? Good thing we didn't do, he didn't finish this painting when this is not what the customer needed. So what he does, he iterates, right? He says, okay, so he makes a change and adds some color. So how about this? Well, the customer says the head is too big. Well, it's a good thing he didn't finish it again. And he makes a change and says, is this better? Well, I prefer bigger eyes, but for the price I pay, it's okay. Right? So that's what iterative means. Right? You take a chunk of something, you give it a, give it a shot, and you show it. Is this good enough? Or you get feedback, and then you t incorporate that feedback and bonify it, and you show it again until you're done. Now, incremental methodologies is a different one. Similar, though. Uh, also, the motivation is that requirements do change. Oh, I messed them up. Uh, iterative is simply iterating. Simply iterating until you get it done. Right? Incremental says, says that partial functionality is va valuable. Uh, so imagine, for example, if you had the, 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 the crazy idea of, uh, of developing a new uh, word processor. Right? Uh, if you look at the usage of the different features in, a, in an existing word processor, you find that, I don't know, if say that 10% of it is used 90% of the time. Right? So if you were to develop a new word processor, if you were to be able to deliver those 90% quickly, you can actually start to get revenues can start to start to charge for that functionality because it's valuable to the customers, even though you don't have the bells, the 90% of the functionality, all the bells and whistles, right? So do something that has a value, and you can actually be able, you might actually be able to start to generate revenue that pay, paying for the continued development of what you're doing. Uh, so here the idea is to break, break the project into smaller chunks that have business value on their own and do one chunk at a time. So it's kind of depicted here. So the UI is the top layer here, the middleware and the back end is simplistic. But, uh, so you have 12 different chunks of functionality, each requiring UI, mi middleware, and, 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 and a back end. Uh, so right here now we have one chunk of completed functionality. In these two, these two chunks, we have done a little bit of the UI, got the UI pa 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 part because we probably did that in these four pi these pieces of functionality when we built that. Right, so we do a little bit of other things as well, but the focus is on one piece of functionality. Right, and here's some that you haven't even started yet. And after a while, you have completed a few of them, and some of them you have not started yet. And eventually, you're finished. Right? So iterative, do something simple, show it, get feedback, modify. Do that until you're done. Uh, incremental, you take a piece of functionality. And now, agile is simply the combination of those two incremental and iterative. You take a piece of functionality, you iterate until you get that right, and then you move on to the next piece of functionality, iterate until you get that right. The traditional way of building things has rather been to start by building this layer underneath here. And then so you build the data, data layer, and then you build the kind of the object layer on top of that. You can access to that data, and then you build the UI on top of that. The problem with doing that is that you might not realize problems down here until you get up here. 
right? Well, if you do one chunk at a time, you're exercising the entire stack, right? And on top of that, so it reduces the risk, but on top of that, it also provides you possibly with functionality that you can sell already. Uh, yeah, so mul multiple iterative is agile. And compared to normal, the traditional project management, uh, you have much more visibility here because imagine as a, as, as, as a, project, a product manager, I'm interested in seeing how, how things are going. If you start by building the back end, you won't be able to show anything until you're done. Right? Here, you will be able to show them small pieces of functionality all along and get their feedback on this. Uh, adaptability, well, since you're picking one piece of functionality at a time, you can modify the other pieces of functionality as much as you want, or the product folks can do that. And it's not going to impact you, because you're not working on that at all yet. As a matter of fact, you might never be working on it because there might be other more important things coming in, coming in before you get to them, right? So for that reason, also, you didn't waste any time designing things that you never implemented because that has no value. If you never implement something, there's no point to design it. And we'll get into that more when we get into the, to the, to the Agile here. Uh, Business value, yeah, it's about being able to de deliver functionality earlier than, than before the whole, the whole thing is, uh, is finished. So the Agile Manifesto, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this, it says that we value. It doesn't say that one is good and the other one is bad. It says we value. We value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We value working software over comprehensive documentation. We value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We value responding to change over following a plan. Right? And the customer collaboration here, this is, this is really interesting because, I mean, the software industry is kind of you have contracts, just like if you ask somebody in another industry to do something for you, you have a contract with them. This t t contract typically uh, contains you know, the pricing, the delivery date, and, and the scope of what you want them to do for you. Uh, well, that's the opposite of collaboration. A contract is, is the opposite. Of, of, of collaboration. A contract is only, the, the purpose of a, a contract is to mitigate risk. It's the whole purpose of a contract. You are not exposed to risk. If they, if they fail to deliver it to you, you have a contract so you can, so, so you, they might be fined because they, don't, they didn't, they didn't uh, uh, deliver. And we, we'll talk more about that. Uh, so that's the summary of this, uh, of this first part. We uh, don't need to go through that now. So let me get on to the uh, next part of the presentation here. So managing with Scrum. Uh, we're going to, in detail, describe Scrum to you. How many of knows? How many have used Scrum? One, two. Okay. So it might be a bit boring, but you know what? When I when I attend presentations and uh, and uh, I've learned this over the years, that if the message is something I feel I already know. Uh, it's so easy for me to, to think that, you know, I know this, I'm not going to listen. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not paying attention at all. Uh, but you're sitting here. Right? You, you are sitting in this room. Uh, and, and there might be something I say that you don't know. You know? <laughs> so it's better to pay attention if you're here. Uh, 
understand if you, if you have difficulties though, if you know this stuff. So we'll talk about the, the details of Scrum and then we'll talk a little bit about where Agile is today as a, as a, as a way of, of, of building software, or developing software-based products. Uh, uh, this is yeah. This was the one from the previous one. Uh, added something at the bottom here. I said developers hate changing requirements, <coughs> and I remember when I asked my 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 reports what they <coughs> what was the most frustrating thing about b being being a developer. It was just that changing requirements. They just kind of wanted the product people to give them a big, a thick bunch of papers and then go away. And then they could close the door, and they could develop that. Right? But that never happened because the product people always have new ideas. You know, they talk to someone, say, "Oh, can you make this that make this change? We need to do this and that and that and that." So the changing requirements come all the time, and it's very frustrating fr frustrating for 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 left left brainers like like ourselves, right? We want we want to, to kind of try to control things, you know, and sitting in front of a computer, right, that's that's when you have the ultimate control, in a way. Because right. you know that the computer tells you if you're wrong, right? Then you know it's the right answer. There's nobody's opinion about things, right? It's it's just me and the code, uh, full control. You think? Uh, so so Scrum. I will just read this in 100 words. So Scrum is an agile process that allows us to focus on delivering the highest business value in the shortest time. It allows us to rapidly and repeatedly inspect I actual working software every two, two weeks to one month. Business sets priorities, teams self-organize to determine the best way to deliver the highest priority features. Every two weeks to a month, anyone can see real working software and decide to release it as is, as is or to continue to enhance it for, for another sprint. So it kind of works like this, right? So this is a, so the client, the client's requirement says that they want this done. This is what they want done. Uh, the orange here corresponds to a client is not happy with what you deliver to them. And notice here, what they want, what they say they want, is something that they would not be happy with, so which is very, very common, because they don't know everything beforehand. A right? uh, simple example here is, uh, say that you have a, some web app and you have a, a list box. It's Select something from a list box, I think, or drop down. Say drop down, just something from a drop down. And uh, so that was the design. We need a drop down here to select the value. Uh, but but just after that requirement was communicated to you, some of the business guys cut a deal with some some partner, which means that that drop down that was going to contain seven items when we decided on having a drop down is now going to contain 500 items so a drop down doesn't work anymore you didn't know that nobody could have known that it just so happened that that business guy met somebody he knew and fantastic it's great for business but you know the requirements out the window now Right? So there's nobody's fault, right? This is just the business operating in a, in a, in a sound way, right? This is an opportunity. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go after that opportunity. So, so what you do in Scrum, instead of, instead of setting out in the direction of what the, of, of what the client is requesting, you're setting out somewhat in that direction. Do something that they, you know that they want. So in that direction. So after one sprint, after one iteration, you show the client what you've done. So yeah, you know, but you know, we need to move a little bit in that direction. So we move a little bit in that direction. And every 
X weeks, whatever schedule you have, you show something to the client, and eventually you move your way closer to something that the client is happy with. Have you taken the client's requirements and the client want, want, went away and you went straight there and delivered that six months later, the client said, well, you know, yeah, I know, you know, that's, I know it what, was what I were asked for, but, you know, it's not really what I want, right? And, and, and us, as engineers, you might think, well, you know, if you ask me to do something and I do it for you, that's the best I can do, right? In, in a sense, in a small sense it is, but top priority is happy clients. Right? So even if you do for them what I ask you to do, if that means that they're not coming back to you for more business, you shouldn't have done that. Right? Even if you gave them exactly what they wanted, you shouldn't have done it. This is another way of looking at it. This is the traditional way, traditional project management. If you're going to build a car, right, you start by building a wheel. And you build another wheel, it's kind of the, the back end in a software application, right? And in Agile, you do this instead. You build something useful, right? And then you enhance that thing that's useful. And eventually you have a happy client, right? I mean, if you happen to reach there in both cases, well, here, you know, you have an open car, so it's probably a happier client. Maybe not here, but in California it is. <laughs> Let me tell you that. <laughs> We had, like this, uh, I looked at the, at the weather forecast now, it was like, so here it's like, uh, I think it, the highest temperature, I'm here for like 12 days or something, the highest temperature is like 9 or 10 or something, and like not, not a chance of me seeing, it, seeing the sky, the sun for, for these 12 days. And I look at the, the schedule back home, and it's like, yeah, the highs are between 16 and 24. <laughs> You know, there's this saying that there's this saying that there's you think it's dolly bad or if it's bad dolly I said that's bullshit. <laughs> but it's more it's not really the temper the most the most what, what affects me the most is the uh, is the uh, uh, kind of daylight. Uh, it's not the rain, it's not the temperature, it's the, it's the daylight that's that got to me finally. Uh, okay, so scrum. So origins of Scrum, these, uh, these four guys, I guess, are, are the most famous in this space. And I actually spent, I spent a lot of time with this guy. Uh, we engaged him as a consultant to, 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 to implement this in a big, big organization. Uh, so I, I kind of learned from, uh, from, from the best here. Uh, by now, there's any number of books on this. Uh, Scrum has is, is, is used everywhere. It's not certain types of applications or certain types of industries. Anything. It's it goes across everything. As a matter of fact, as 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 you might you might see later on, uh, it doesn't even have anything to do with software development. Scrum has nothing to do with software development. I had a friend in New York who who used Scrum to run his home. Uh, and it worked well for him. A little bit nerdy, maybe for 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 my taste, but but you know whatever works. Uh, yeah, all kinds of applications. So let's uh, let's look at this one again. We value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We value working software over comprehensive documentation. We value customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We value responding to change over following a plan. So here is kind of how it works. So you still have analysis and design and coding and testing. But rather than, tip as typically is being done, do one of these things at a time, you, you do a little bit of everything at the same time. So you do enough analysis so you can start the design. You do enough, when you have done enough design, you can start the implementation. When you have done enough implementation, you can start the testing, unless you do 
TDD ones, you know. But that's kind of the, the, the general idea. So, so we have self-organizing teams, meaning that the teams decide how to solve the problems that, that they take on. Uh, the product or the service or whatever you're building progresses in a series of two to four week sprints. You're going to have one week sprints here because it's, it's uh, educational. Typ the, the typical today is two weeks. Uh, requirements show up as items on, on a product backlog. We will see what that is. Uh, it says nothing about engineering practices. So it says nothing about TDD or, or, or extreme programming or how you actually develop the code. It says nothing about that. You still, I mean, using Scrum, uh, you still might have to adhere to organizational guidelines when it comes to, to, to documentation and stuff like that, or, or what uh, technology stack we are allowed to use because it's different in different organizations. So you're not completely free. There are organizational const constraints. Uh, sprints. So they make progress in a series of sprints, as I said before, two to four weeks. Uh, a constant duration leads to a better rhythm for the team. And the product is designed, coded, and tested during one sprint. And you realize you can only do that if you pick one small chunk of functionality, because otherwise you would never be finished in one sprint. And once a sprint has started, there is no changes, none. Completely illegal to make a change after, after a sprint has started. The product folks can make any changes they want in between sprints. But once they push the button go, they're not allowed to change anything in this sprint. So, so it's kind of a happy medium between product people interrupting the developers all the time and product people not being able to interrupt developers at all. It says that once a week when you meet with the team, you can say anything you want to the team. Ask anything, ask them to do anything you want. We'll see, the team decides what they do. But, but uh, uh, so you have the opportunity as a product manager to actually change things but not during that week. And developers get this week with peace of mind from no, 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 ch no changes. So we'll spend some time on this one, I think. Uh, <laughs> so on the left here, we have the product owner. Product owner is just a scrum term for, for product manager, the person responsible for the product. So they take input from end users, customers, the team itself, and other stakeholders. Right? And based on that input, they produce something called a product backlog, which you can think of as, as a list of features, a list of functionality. Uh, at the beginning of every sprint, there's a sprint planning meeting. At the sprint planning meeting, the team looks at this list. It's a prioritized list of features. They look at this list, and they select features here, taking priority into account, that they commit to doing during the next sprint. Right? Nobody tells them what they need to do, but the team looks at this list and they select features from that list. It turns out that if, if the team selects what they commit to do, it turns out that the motivation is way higher than if somebody tells them what they're going to do, right? And, and you know, I mean, you might think that, OK, the well, team can select almost nothing. Yeah, but you know, if you select almost nothing, you don't like your job, you're not going to stay very long. Right? It turns out that, that very quickly, the teams actually take pride in, in performing. 
right? To perform as well as they can as a team. Uh, and this selection happens together with the product owner, where the team does, uh, 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 pulls the trigger on what to select. But if they have questions about anything at all, the product owner is there to talk to them. It might not be clear. There might be some, 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 some uh, 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 corner cases and stuff that product owner hasn't thought of, and the team knows that. And so they ask the product owner, what do we do with this and that? And each feature here is then translated into a number of tasks. So these are technical tasks, right? So what do we need to do as a team, given the existing product, what do we need to do as a team from a technical perspective in order to deliver that this feature at the end of this sprint? So these are kind of uh, say design and coding and testing tasks here. And we'll, we'll look at that, what they look like. Uh, then the print sprint starts, so no changes, <coughs> either in the length of the sprint or what's, or what's going to be done in the sprint. Uh, every day is a daily scrum. We'll talk about what happens at that daily meeting. Uh, and the team might work a little bit on, on, on trying to better understand the product backlog. Uh, at the end of the sprint, there's a review which Lasse talked about before, so where the team presents what they have done to the product owner. The product owner is the customer kind of for the team. And so they present what they have done, and the product owner says, well, you know, well, that looks good. That looks good. We can roll this one out. We can ship this one, incorporate that into to, 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 to our, our uh, uh, however we're releasing things. Or the product owner might says, say, you know, now that I see it, I think we really need to modify this a little bit. So uh, put this, this feature back on the backlog with the, pro the appropriate modifications that the, 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 the uh, uh, product owner wants. Does this make kind of sense? So I'll go through in detail. Uh, the different kind of uh, terms in Scrum. So we have three roles, uh, product owner, Scrum master, and team. We have four different ceremonies or meetings, a sprint planning meeting, a sprint review meeting, a sprint retrospective meeting, and a daily Scrum meeting. And there are three artifacts that are being produced. It's the product backlog itself. It's a sprint backlog with the tasks. And it's a burn down chart, which helps you see how you're doing. Kind of. And we'll see all of this. So first, the roles. So the product owner defines the features of the product in, in expressed as user stories. In the familiarity with user stories? Some? OK, good. Uh, they decide on release date and content in the release. They're responsible for the for uh, profitability of the product. Uh, they prioritize based on market value, and they adjust and prioritize the product backlog before every iteration. So at every iteration, at every sprint planning meeting, when you look at the product backlog, it reflects in order of priority what the product owner feels is best to do for this product. And that might change because the, 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 the landscape might change or the product owner has new ideas or whatever it is, right? So, so just because something is at the top of the product backlog at one point doesn't mean it's going to stay close to the top if it's not being done. It might be ditched with something else. You never know. And if it is, it's a good thing you didn't spend any time on it. Uh, and the product owner accepts or rejects work results. The Scrum Master is responsible for enacting the Scrum values and practices. So this the Scrum Master is kind of a project manager. Uh, responsible for removing barriers to the team's success. For example, say that the team needs help with some uh, uh, another, uh, another database or whatever it is, right? And they don't have that expertise on the team. They don't know how to do it then it's the, it's the Scrum Master's responsibility to 
eliminate that barrier for the team, to find somebody who can do what the team needs in order to move forward. Uh, they ensure that the team is functional, so they are responsible for the, the, for the, for the, for the, the personalities dealing with that kind of stuff. Uh, enables close cooperation and shields the team from external interferences. So protect the team from the product folks. The team itself, five to nine people, cross-functional. So there are, there are developers, testers, UI designers, whatever they need on a one team. So it's not, not you don't go, else, go elsewhere for those kind of services. Uh, the team selects the work for the sprint. They're self-organizing, meaning they determine how that work can get done. And you're not definitely not changing members of a team in the sprint, in the middle of a sprint. Absolutely not. Ideally, never. I definitely never change people on a team. Because the, the longer they work the better together, the better they get to know each other, their strengths and weaknesses. So it just gets better and better and better. The ceremonies, so the sprint planning meeting, uh, the input to the sprint planning meeting is, is uh, the capacity of the team, which we will get into, how to measure that. Uh, the product backlog, business conditions, current product, and technology. So the first thing that happens uh, at, the, at the sprint planning meeting is that the team looks at the product backlog and try to evaluate how, how, how big is that. Uh, and they select what they're going to do in the sprint. And then they decide how to achieve whatever they're going to do uh, with some design. Uh, so they create a, a sprint backlog with the tasks. And they estimate the sprint backlog, these tasks, in hours. Right, so you look at one task, you don't need to code this in this class, you think, oh, it's going to take two hours, or whatever it is. Right? And we get into that as well, how that's being used and why it's important. So the output is essentially a sprint backlog of this meeting. Uh, so the team selects the user stories that they want, uh, create the sprint backlog. Uh, notice here that the, the create, creation of the sprint backlog the tasks is a collaborative effort. So the team sits down and looks at these, at the, uh, at these tasks. And somebody might think, somebody might have no idea about how to carry out the task. So they have no idea. Is this going to take an hour? Is it going to take 16 hours? Somebody else might know how to do it. So they know it's going to take one hour. So the good estimate for that would be one hour if somebody knows how to do it. Uh, you have some high-level design. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a user story, a bad user story, still a user story kind of. As a vacation planner, I want to see photos of the hotels. Well, when a team sees that, they might realize, given the certain technology, that they need to code something in the middle tier, and that's probably going to take about eight hours and code some UI, four hours, some text fix fixtures, uh, code some new class, and update some perform performance tests. So these are the tasks that end up on the sprint backlog. Uh, let's see here how much I have. OK. Uh, so a sprint, so it's a four-week iteration. You're going to have one week. Uh, the team only commits to work that they can do, right? Only commit to, to what you, you can do. Uh, normally, the sprint planning meeting is eight hours. Your meeting is probably going to be like one or two hours or something at most. Uh, and so this is what it typically, typically looks like. You have a sprint planning meeting long sprint planning meeting, and then you actually do the sprint, and at the end you have a long review meeting. But yours are going to be way shorter than these. That's a sprint planning meeting. The daily scrum 
It's a 15 minute meeting, it's a stand up meeting. Uh, the meeting is not for problem solving. You're not allowed to solve problems in this meeting. Problems will pop up in this meeting. They will surface. You discuss those after this meeting. Uh, anybody can come to this meeting. So the product folks can come to this meeting if they want to. But they cannot talk. They have no say in that. The sprint has started. There's no changes. There's no distractions. If they want to come there and sit in and listen to, f to get a feel for how things are going, they're free to do that. But they're not allowed to talk. And this, you might feel like a daily meeting, you know, but it helps so many unnecessary meetings, like this daily meeting. And what happens in this meeting, uh, each team member is asked three questions. What did you do yesterday? What will you do today? Is anything in your way? It's that simple. So, which means that it will never be more than 24 hours before you know that somebody's waiting for you. Right? So, so, so that doesn't happen. Well, I didn't know he was waiting for that. Uh, you will know. Right? And that's the most important part of it. Right? Uh, and, and, uh, and it's not a status meeting. You're not communi communicating status to... to, to to the Scrum Master, but you're committing to your fellow, to your peers. Says, okay, this is what I did yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. I need this from you. Right? Sometimes the Scrum Master, uh, I typically do this. I turn my back to the team in this meeting because otherwise it's so easy to to speak to the Scrum Master. Because even even though one of you will play the role of Scrum Master in your team, uh, that it's it's kind of a manager. Right, so you tend to speak to that man, you're telling them how what you've done and, and so on. But it's not to them you should speak, you should speak to the to your peers. Uh, the sprint review. Here the team presents so at the end of the sprint, presents what they've accomplished. Uh, typically a demo. Uh, these two hour prep time. Uh, you don't have two hour prep time, you might have ten minutes prep time. Uh, no slides. This is sh this is functionality. You're showing because because the user stories are features, and and either that feature is done or is not done. It's not the design of the feature. At times you might want to show a database schema as as a as a deliverable or something, but but 99% of the time what's being shown is functioning software. Uh, the whole team participates in this, and you can invite the world. Anybody can come to this meeting. After the review, you have a retrospective. Again, three questions for the team. It says, is there anything that we're not doing that we should start doing? It could be. Uh, an example here is that uh, we should code together once a week. We should, even if we cannot be in the same physical location, we should all be working on this on, on Thursday afternoons together. Right? It could be something you might, might want to try to start doing. Uh, is there anything that we're doing that we should stop doing? Could be uh, spamming the team with with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, jokes on Slack or whatever whatever it is, right? Is there anything we should stop doing, and is there anything that we should continue doing? Right? So, so and this and the interesting thing with the retrospective is that it's it it it's an expression of humility in the process itself, right? Because we're saying here that embrace change, right? We don't know everything. And what this is telling us is that we don't even know how we're going to do the work, right? How we're going to work together. So, so we, are, we say that we're willing to learn how to work better together. We don't get it right from the beginning, right? So, so, so it's really embracing the, the, the embracing of the embracing of change in a way, right? In the process itself, on the meta level. Uh, I think we uh, break for lunch there. 
so I guess I just turn this off for now. Uh, so can we start again at when do you want to start? One? Is one okay? Yeah. One one sharp? Okay? Okay. Thank you.